the Super Show. I'm the show's host, Scott Holcomb, Superintendent of North Federal Public Schools. And I have a special guest with me today, newly appointed Assistant Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Lori McEwen. Dr. Thank McEwen, you for having me. <laughs> welcome. Thank you for having me, Superintendent Holcomb. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, a couple of questions. The yes. community wants to know a little bit more about Dr. McEwen. So if you wouldn't mind walking us through your past experiences that have led you on this journey and uh, what brought you to North Attleboro, that would kind of be a good start to our show. Sure. Uh, well, it's a relatively uh, long story, so I won't tell you all the details. Um, but I decided I wanted to go into education when I was 17 years old. I knew that uh, that was the way to change the world and so I started teaching uh, in Taunton, Mass. Actually, I started in Uxbridge, Mass. I taught in Taunton, Mass. I taught in Missouri. And then I went into administration. Um, I've been a middle school assistant principal in Derry, New Hampshire. I was a high school assistant principal in uh, Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Um, I've been the director of academics at a charter school network in Rhode Island. And I was the chief of instruction, leadership, and equity for the Providence Public Schools. Um, when I found out that there was an opening here, um, you and I were in contact, and I was glad that you asked me to come on board and join you as interim, and uh, thrilled that I found a place here, and that I was appointed as assistant superintendent on Wednesday night. So that's briefly my journey. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great journey. The, um, the other part, too, I think is important for people to know is that uh, during the process of applying for superintendency, yes. I had put my name in, and you had put your name yes. in. Um, and lo and behold, things worked out where I, I received the job, and just by f good fortune, I was going through all those resumes, and your name had yes. come up, and then I just interviewed you, and we went out and had talked about a few things about education, and a lot of your core values came to the surface. So one thing maybe we could talk about, too, is, you know, in, in your mind, in what I've seen so far, what do you believe is the most important tenet of public education, especially for North Attleboro? Um, so I think the, the most important thing that we do in education, North Attleboro and everywhere, is prepare our students for success um, in the lives that they choose. Make sure that they are able to, they are given all the resources, all the opportunities to learn and to grow as people and as students so that they can make the choice that's right for them. So we need to put things in front of them, instill in them a growth mindset so that they can learn, make mistakes, and learn again. Um, and we surround them with people who are strong in content area, strong in skill area, who can help them all grow to be the people that they're meant to be and achieve success. Beautiful. So we're going to kind of nice springboard for us to move forward now to talk about uh, a couple important things for our district. And those are the uh, strategic plan and the district improvement plan. Uh, on May 1st, yes. we have a school committee meeting. And we're going to present the strategic plan and the uh, district improvement plan to uh, the school committee for them to vote on. And uh, so I thought right now we could kind of go through a process that took place uh, prior to your arrival that sure. uh, led to the development of a strategic plan. So just so everyone knows about this, the strategic plan is a, a five-year plan that we're looking at that's going to help set the stage and govern the direction our, our public schools go to and go forward to in the, in the district here. Um, a lot of people are asking, how do we develop that? And so I think it's important that we, we talk about to everyone how they came up with a strategic plan. So right. former superintendent uh, Susan Cullen, right. she had given out uh, numerous surveys to the community. She had had a bunch of focus groups. Those included um, faculty members, administrators, community mem members, uh, students to <coughs> arrive at the strategic plan that we're going to see up on, uh, on Monday at the, mm -hmm. at the school committee on May 1st. And then from that, um, maybe you could take the, the reins and talk a little bit so far um, about how we took the strategic plan, the information from all those surveys and focus groups, and wove that into the overall district improvement plan. We don't have to talk about the of it mm -hmm. yet because the school committee hasn't voted on it. So if you can just talk about maybe a broad stroke of 
of what that's all about that might be uh, helpful to people at home. Sure. So talk about how we've gone through these steps with leaders and, and been collaborative, right? Got, that's it. You got it. Um, so we've taken the strategic plan, um, looked at the various components of it, and through our district leadership team meetings, we've brought people into the fold to think about how we might um, really operationalize some of these big ideas, uh, what they might look, look like for first steps, second steps, um, and how we've already are moving towards some of these goals and what we can do further. So we've had these iterative processes where we've brought people together in small groups, let mm -hmm. them share work, learn from each other, and then, um, and then you've reviewed some of that, you've, you finally hone it, and then bring it to us again so we can go through the process again. So it's an iterative process. Right. One thing too, it has, um, just so people know when it's released, it has a lot of um, goals, mm -hmm. objectives, that are clearly stated that can be yep. measured. It has timelines associated with it. It has the people responsible to seeing those through. Right. Some of these things have uh, financial implications and will take a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. Other ones just take uh, time and, and people to accomplish. And so those eventually, once we have the district improvement plan set, the next step, it all funnels down into the school improvement plans. Right. And I believe I uh, inadvertently said the school improvement plan and strategic plan were going to be introduced to the uh, school committee. I'd first said that, but I want to say again, it's the strategic plan and district improvement plan mm -hmm. that the school committee will, will vote on. And then the school improvement plan is what right. comes out of the, the work of those. And those line up with how each individual school is going to accomplish the goals and objectives set out in the district improvement plan. Um, once that's been established, those funnel into the goals that we set for ourselves as administrators, mm -hmm. uh, both within the, the district level mm -hmm. and sometimes also the goals that teachers may set for themselves to help accomplish this. Mm -hmm. So there's a streamline effect that, are, that occurs from the strategic plan to the district improvement plan to the school improvement plan right. to goals of administrators to goals of all the people within our buildings. Right. Uh, and the trick is to keep that, that focus, but yet, and it's really a, a, a tightrope act mm -hmm. we walk of trying to have the focus, but allow for that autonomy outside of it also, because mm -hmm. you don't want to choke out the autonomy in, at any level that right. we have. And so that's the, uh, the artistry of right. how to make this happen. We want to make sure that um, folks at their buildings are autonomous, but we also want to have um, shared efficiencies of learning. And so when things are going really well at one school or, or folks are trying something, we want to make sure that there are the opportunities for people to learn from one another, which is mm -hmm. why we've come together as district leaders to do some of this work mm -hmm. together and, and in that process learning more about what's happening at each individual school as well. Right. So the timing of this was a, a little bit off. Uh, what I mean by this is that in May the school committee is going to be presented with a strategic plan and district improvement mm -hmm. plan. However, at the last meeting okay. we just had on April 5th, it was a Wednesday, mm -hmm. the school committee approved the superintendents, my goals. Right. And so I thought that people should know, and I didn't really, yes. I don't think uh, at the school committee meeting I, I explained it to this depth as to why, um, you know, the chicken came before the egg or the egg came before the chicken. It seems mm -hmm. like almost, if I was watching from home, the sequence was a little bit off, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I want to let everyone know that um, if you're watching at home, that those goals that were presented by uh, myself on April 5th, those were taken from the results of the surveys in focus groups that were done by former superintendent uh, Susan Cullen. Those three that we'll talk about in a minute, they'll be found embedded within the district improvement plan. Mm -hmm. So you'll see a little overlap um, if people are watching between what it was presented for my goals on the April 5th meeting right. and then the district improvement plan which will come out at the uh, May 1st meeting. Maybe a little backwards, some people may think, but it still is going to accomplish mm -hmm. a streamlined uh, approach. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe we could talk about Your goals. some of those goals Great. with people, <laughs> let people know what's going on. Um, talk about maybe the magnitude and the gravity mm -hmm. of those goals. Yep. Now, sometimes it seems like um, if I was at home or if I was just listening to this, almost superficial, a little bit like, oh, it doesn't seem like too robust. Mm -hmm. It may not seem too deep. Yep. So I think if we go through this, and I mentioned that maybe you can help to describe, you know, the depth at which we're talking about right. without pigeonholing us into any kind of granular piece because we still want to make sure that the admin team and all the people that get affected right. by this, the teachers and everyone, are also 
working collaboratively to uh, help accomplish these. Right. Right. So the first one we can talk about is we had one set forth that we want to embed, you know, um, the academic, social, and emotional learning core competencies, mm -hmm. you know, throughout our district mm -hmm. at the various levels. Right. Um, I think, and I'll turn it over to you in a second, that we have the social emotional uh, teams established at all of our schools mm -hmm. throughout, the, throughout the district right. to deal with different, a myriad of things that pop up throughout the day mm -hmm. that students may um, elicit during the day or it may come preloaded with as they enter our schools. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about these core competencies embedded throughout our district, um, some people may think it's okay, it's a fly over 30,000 feet. It seems like we can handle that, no big deal. But maybe you could describe you know, um, without getting too, too specific and, like I said, pigeonholing us at all into any one thing until we get all the stakeholders more involved, mm -hmm. what else would you like to add? Maybe you could add to that, and I'll work off those comments, too. Uh, well, when we talk about social-emotional learning core competencies, I think sometimes we start to think that we're talking just about student behavior. Um, and, and we're not. We have found that students are coming to us more and more with anxiety issues, either as youngsters or uh, that they have them in their high school years when they're thinking about the, the pressure that might be enormous about going to college, making life choices, etc. And if we don't attend to those social emotional issues that kids bring to the table, we can't help them be successful in their academic mm -hmm. learning. Um, and so we're thinking about things like how we help students have um, a growth mindset how they persevere through their learning, how they regulate their own emotions so that they can come fully to the learning. And so, yes, we're embedding those um, throughout the curriculum, but it's a lot of what teachers do mm -hmm. um, regularly. We're trying to codify that across the district right. so that we can help support that and have consistency from classroom to classroom and across the district so that students know what to expect and um, how to be supported in their learning. I don't know if you want me to go mm -hmm. any deeper. No, I think it's a great point. I think, um, you know, anxiety is something I think that many of us experience. Right. The issue with, with anxiety is it can be a, a multi-pronged uh, issue that we all have. One, it could motivate us to succeed. Mm -hmm. However, there's other anxiety that we experience that can actually call, cause us to almost, uh, you know, go into that primitive brain stem that we all have that says, you know, fight or flight or freeze. Right. And I think what you're trying to speak about, too, is how do we, as, as school systems, even mm -hmm. beyond North Attleboro, mm -hmm. help students come in, work through the feelings of anxiety, and not have those feelings interfere with the curriculum they're trying mm -hmm. to learn and get to. Right. So you want them to be exposed to that without putting up a block mentally, you know, that's going to mm -hmm. interfere with the foundation of education that we're trying to lay. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a delicate balance that we try to do in schools that you you spoke of. And part of social emotional learning too is that we help children to become metacognitive. We help them to be aware of what they're thinking, what they're going through, so they can solve their own problems and they can um, bring their best selves forward because mm -hmm. they know themselves. And so when students know mm -hmm. themselves as learners, um, as individuals, then they can approach the learning in the way that best makes sense for them um, and be successful. Mm -hmm. This was something that was started off by the school district last year also. We just have to see this through. This will take probably anywhere from three to five years Definitely. to really deeply embed. It's not a, a quick hitting right. thing. It has many, many steps. And if people want to see those steps of how we're going to accomplish mm -hmm. it, they can go on to the district website, www.naschools.net, yeah. and they can see the superintendent goals, and they can see this one and all the action steps that go along with it. Mm -hmm. Last year, we had Jessica Minahan right. come in as a presenter. Mm -hmm. um, not sure if you had a chance to read her book yet. I haven't, um, but several of the principals have spoken highly of it. Right. And how so it's affected them. the behavior code yes. um, that she wrote, so she talked about that, came in, she was a dynamic presenter, mm -hmm. put a lot of great ideas forward, but it mm -hmm. all surfaces around social emotional learning and core competencies. Right. So uh, we're going to continue on with that journey. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we had was we want to embed the digital literacy computer skills yes. within our pre-K through 12 curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that in, in today's day and age, uh, we're moving further and further and deeper deeper into the use of technology within our schools mm -hmm. on a daily basis within our classrooms. Um, if people have been following the, the we call it CBT mm -hmm. for MCAS 2.0, it's mm -hmm. computer-based tests for the Massachusetts Comprehensive Assessment System. They developed a new test called the 2.0 in particular grade levels 
are required to take those assessments, those tests, right. online using computers. Mm -hmm. And so looking at it from 30,000 feet also mm -hmm. and gathering all the information from grassroots, it's very important that not only just for that test, I don't want people to right. think that it's all about a test and people doing well on MCAS. That's a piece right. of the pie, but it's to embed these digital literacy skills within the curriculum, daily curriculum, so mm -hmm. that students are experiencing these things at a progression that makes sense for the grade level all the way through until they grade out um, right. typically in grade, grade 12. So, I don't know if you want to talk about that also and, and let people know a little more about it, but that's another one of our goals. Again, a goal that's, yep. just to remind everyone, like, we're talking a three to five year type goal. These are not going to happen overnight because they take time, they take people, they take, mm -hmm. unfortunately, some of them takes money for mm -hmm. infrastructure. But go ahead, why don't you talk about that too? Well, and so I think digital literacy, very near and dear to my heart, and I'm, I'm so glad that we're embedding these core competencies in the district. And as you said, not because of the MCAS test. Uh, MCAS is online now, and we'll be putting more and more students on online as years come. But even more than that, we're using digital applications in the classroom mm -hmm. for learning. And that allows students, if we go back to the social-emotional learning core competencies, mm -hmm. it allows children to bring their best selves to their learning. It, um, it uh, blended applications allow students to have more voice and choice. And once they mm -hmm. know themselves metacognitively, they know how they learn best, they can make the, the choice that's best for them. Uh, and teachers can support that with a wealth of tools. The concern, however, is, and we all know what it's like to live in a digital world, things change so fast. Mm -hmm. um, and we need our students to not just communicate and collaborate with, um, with digital applications, uh, but also to have the literacy that they need to choose, both teachers and students, to choose the best applications and to use um, digital applications wisely um, to distinguish fake news from real news, to understand the best resources out there um, that will help their learning. And so to be digitally, digitally literate is a skill that we all need in 21st century. So I'm mm -hmm. really excited about that. And that goes hand in hand with the learning. It's not apart mm -hmm. from. The core content curriculum, it aids the content mm -hmm. curriculum in the same way those social emotional core competencies mm -hmm. aren't separate, but they aid in the learning. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited that you've brought these two goals together and that we'll be working on this as a district team. Thanks. Hopefully this uh, makes education, we optimize it for our right. faculty, for our students uh, involving this technology. Uh, one thing I've seen at the upper levels, uh, mm -hmm. including college, as we talk about getting people ready for college and career, you know, I, I've seen the uh, efficiency at which students can submit work right. being done. You know, in accessing information. You know, uh, I was reading a report the other day in, um, I think it was Science Magazine, and it talked about uh, people becoming cyborgs. Mm -hmm. And what they meant by that comment, if you think about a cyborg, it's, you know, it's kind of a, a cross between a computer and a person. Right. And they looked at society as a whole across the U.S. and they were showing how many people actually had instant access to technology in their hands. Mm -hmm. And they said right away they can look up any information on that tool, uh, call it their cell phone, whatever it is that they're using, to see if what's being talked about is even true. Mm -hmm. So we have to teach students those skills of how to identify you know, fake news versus right. real news. You know, and then uh, anything else to solve problems. Right. right now we can watch a video, instructional video online of how to solve most problems. So mm -hmm. it's about how to use these tools efficiently right. and effectively to let students know how to navigate the complexities of life that exist sometimes within the school setting and a lot of times outside of it. And um, at Roger Williams University, mm -hmm. all the documents that are submitted um, to the professors mm -hmm. there are all done through uh, Blackboard. Right. Blackboard is just a platform they use, just a name, right. could be any name. Uh, Blackboard, they chose to buy that. Everyone submits uh, things, their assignments electronically. So if we write a paper, it's a wonderful tool. You, you submit the paper electronically, it automatically checks to mm -hmm. see if anything was plagiarized. And then it allows the professors to really quickly get back, you know, feedback to students, you know, right mm -hmm. there. And they can type and uh, yep. usually a lot faster than they can write. And those things can transcend down into uh, end of the public schools as well, right. North Attleboro and others. Right, and it's yeah. so efficient for the teacher to the student, but also it really helps with those collaboration skills for students to collaborate with one another um, on these platforms. And so uh, Blackboard at Roger Williams, and, and right. here we use Office 365, and we've mm -hmm. had teachers exploring Microsoft Classroom, other right. districts use Google Classroom, and um, 
it's really exciting in the way it engages learners. But and that's what we can do as we look at the future of having these meetings here with, with North TV, mm -hmm. the Supers show as we decide to coin it. You know, we can have people in like our technology director, Lynn right. Weagle, mm -hmm. who's been working tirelessly for many, many years in the district to fix the, right. the infrastructure that we have mm -hmm. to bring forward more devices for our students to, yeah. to use, you know, our, our teachers to use, mm -hmm. to talk about the capital improvement project planning and mm -hmm. how that all factors into the technology plan. So again, too, I'd be, you know, we'd be remiss not to talk about those people that right. are working, you know, sometimes behind the scenes, you know, tirelessly right. to make these things uh, come to light. So just thinking on the spot, how nice it would be, be to, bring, to have uh, her in. bring Lynn in to talk, yeah. about, uh, talk about this whole piece. So that was two goals. And so superintendents have to talk about not only the, the, those two goals, but a third goal, um, kind of like a personal mm -hmm. goal, uh, professional practice, as it's called. And so one thing we looked at was, um, and I think it's not something that, um, I think it's not something unique to North Attleboro mm -hmm. Public Schools. I think as you look at organizations that are reside uh, in the business domain and in public schools, people constantly talk about, we have to communicate and collaborate right. more efficiently and more effectively. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we can look at, that's one of the goals for the superintendent myself to do, is how do we communicate more um, effectively. So it's about trying to gather baseline data as to how we're collaborating right now in, in communicating and then to come up with a vision for the future as to what else we can add into the, into mm -hmm. the mix. Uh, this show, the super show, <laughs> yeah. is something that um, you know, was part of that right. goal to communicate that way. The YouTube channel mm -hmm. that we have um, started to bring up for our public school mm -hmm. system was, was a way to do that. We have the um, Facebook page for the district. We have the Twitter, Twitter account that we have for the district. We have Blackboard Connect that we send out the connected messages mm -hmm. to the district. We have Blackboard, uh, you can do that voice or you can do that right. you know, email. There's the um, texting application that's part of Blackboard Connect that we have mm -hmm. cell phones. If you know, people choose, we can do it that way. And to really take stock as to how we're communicating at the school level also mm -hmm. to see what's out there. Report that to the community as to how you can mm -hmm. access all this information from the schools you know, and to optimize our communication with the town and then to solicit uh, a feedback loop. Yep. How are we doing with that? What more do we want? And how much can the organization actually uh, take on with right. the, the, the fixed funds and the fixed people we have? And that's mm -hmm. why volunteers are sometimes just so important. Absolutely. So I appreciate you having me on for this <laughs> first super show. And I think it is a great motive. This is one very good mode of communication and there right. are others. And we also notice one last thing before we, we wrap things up with the show today is that we've seen so far in North Attleboro and heard from people too that there is a uh, large desire from many constituents to donate uh, into the public schools of yeah. North Attleboro. Uh, we've just seen that with a tremendous donation uh, to the Falls School PTO through the um, Quan's Kitchen through Eric Quan and his mm -hmm. family donated $35,000 to help with the completion of the playground project at Fall School, right. which should be taking place, I believe, this, the breaking of the ground yes. over uh, April vacation, if I if I remember the. That's uh, how I remember it as well. Right. Yep. So what we're going to do as a as a district in the near future is come up with possibly a donors board, mm -hmm. items that we know as a district that we need for our students to have to uh, help to optimize their educational experience in North Attleboro that people can donate directly towards. So they right. can trace, a lot of times with any organization, people want to be able to follow their dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, you, you need to do what with that? You need to buy a set of books for science. Whatever dollar cost it is, okay, I can see that. I can put my money right into that, and I can see where the dollar actually goes. Right. So I don't know if you want to say anything about that, but that's the last thing we're going to be talking about today. Um, I won't say much, and we'll unveil it soon, but I think, you know, we have a lot of needs, and I think there are people who have specific interests in, you know, whether it's technology in the district, it was a playground for Mr. Right. Kwan because he was so excited about, you know, seeing children happy outside playing and, and getting fresh air and enjoying themselves on a playground, but others have other interests and really want to um, yeah. give something forward, and so I think that's a, that's a great way to bring more resources of all, all types into the district. Right. So uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Hopefully you can join us next time where I hope to be talking about budget-related issues in a positive light, meaning 
If more funds come into North Federal Public Schools, what those funds will be directly given towards in what we can get from those funds to help benefit the students in the town as a whole. So thanks again. I'm Scott Holcomb, your Superintendent of Public Schools. Thank you.